What's good, y'all? It's Boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out 10 great feuds that ended with terrible matches. We've all been, uh, well, we've all seen at some point uh, a great feud. The feud is intense. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, the rivalry is there. It's getting personal. We get to the final match. The match is gonna end it all. And uh, it doesn't live up to the hype. It does happen. It does happen. That's just that's just the, the interesting thing about or well, the interesting part about wrestling sometimes the feud can be greater than the final match and sometimes the feud can be not that good and the final match be fantastic so we're going to check out uh some of these moments appreciate all the love and support you guys have shown on the channel let's get right into this one your mind into the dark backward and abysm of time two weeks ago we ran a list on parts fun known about terrible feuds that ended with great wrestling matches mm -hmm. well we checked let that me video work out. it put my thing down flip it and reverse it <laughs> to translate what about great feuds that ended with terrible matches it's such a horrible phenomenon when it happens when the story being told is super engaging and fun but once that bell rings it deflates like rear ripley's bouncy castle putting all those weeks worth of television all that money all that audience investment the editing mm -hmm. time gone into the video packages also the final product the thing that shifted the tickets the match itself it's bad it's so sad when it happens mm -hmm. well let's get sad i'm adam hailing from parts fun known and here are 10 great feuds that ended with terrible matches. Number 10, AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe. Wendy. That was a good feud. <laughs> now look, I'm completely honest, this one feud wasn't the very best that's ever existed, but I had to it include was good. AJ Styles' 2018 WWE Championship run on this list somewhere, cause bloody hell. Imagine this, AJ Styles, one of the best wrestlers in the world has just won the belt in 2017, mm -hmm. and I appear wearing Doc Brown time travel gear to tell you, hey, AJ's gonna hold the belt for an entire year, and he's gonna feud with Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, Shinsuke Nakamura, and Samoa Joe, and it'll all be pretty bad. You'd kill me in the street, <laughs> but it's true, though. Every time the hype machine went into overdrive, because AJ Styles is very occasionally the best wrestler in the world, and every single time things got personal and heated in all the right places, but nearly every single time it ended in some convoluted DQ, yeah. no contest, dick dance. The Styles-Joe feud started so bloody well, with Joe elevating it to hilarious B-movie melodrama trying to bone down with Mrs. Styles, yeah. but all the matches <laughs> descended into underwhelming nonsense apart from AJ and Joe's match at Super Showdown. That was a strong definitive end to the feud. So obviously they did it again and crowned Jewel one last time in a dull 10 minute match. King God. Number nine, yeah, Daniel man. Bryan. That, uh, the Wendy. <laughs> Joe is so good, man. Joe is so damn good. He, oh. It just pains me to know that we had this guy in the company and at no point he was ever the WWE champion. What could have been? What could have been? versus The Miz. And speaking of Super Showdown, not the Saudi Arabia ones, the one in Australia, this event, which was mostly good, saw the final blow-off match between Daniel Bryan and The Miz, the feud which had been part organically. I actually didn't even watch this match. I didn't watch this show, actually. The Super Showdown show, I never watched it. Actual. <laughs> I, I think I forgot that it was on, and I just didn't care to check it out. So this is all fresh to me. Part accidentally built for anywhere between two and eight years from Daniel Bryan's first day in the company via a beautiful confrontation on Talking Smack escalating through Miz chicanery while Bryan was retired and then finally becoming physical in 2018. Their first match at SummerSlam was great, mm -hmm. super heated. Their styles meshed, Miz won via cheating. That's okay though, it's the first match. Then the wives got involved, yeah. mixed tag at Hell in a Cell. Miz and Mrs. won that one too. Okay, it's a bit weird i guess they're just saving brian's big win for the third and final match that came at super showdown and brian did win it's just that the match lasted two minutes and ended with a small package the video package was longer than the match does i guess and that was i'm glad i didn't see that that would have pissed me off i'm glad i didn't watch this show that's it that's the end what a waste of so much time. Number eight, Johnny Gargano versus Tommaso Ciampa. Might catch some flack for this, but sod it. 
I'm right, the Johnny Gargano Tommaso Ciampa feud in NXT will probably go down as the greatest rivalry in the history of the black and gold. Built for Facts. years with a gooey center of genuine heartbreak and one of the purest face heel dynamics in modern wrestling spread yep. over a series of phenomenal takeover matches. It was going to blow off a takeover in New York before Ciampa went out injured, uh -huh. so Gargano pivoted to Adam Cole instead. No one would have batted an eye at the feud ending there. Not ideal, but it had been running for the better part of a year. However, they picked it up again and it uh -huh. slipped right through their fingers and smashed on the ground. Gargles turned heel, which felt really yeah. strange, cost Champa the title before the whole thing actually culminated in a cinematic match. And yeah, it was it was that was a very interesting decision. Obviously, when Tommaso came back, he was going to be you know greeted as a face. So it was very interesting to see they turned him heel, which. From a storyline standpoint, I get it. The guy did cause him some some chaos and, and, and problems. So I can understand him wanting to get him back. But at the same time, you know, it was it was it was a weird dynamic. But I didn't have a problem with it. Me personally, him going heel. Because it makes sense. The guy threw your wedding ring. The dude was a menace before he got hurt. So I can get the no love lost situation. That's I'm really sorry. It was a bad cinematic match. Awkward, really self-serious, and ending in yet another weird feeling yeah. swerve from Candice LeRae. One of I the best fun feuds it, ever, ending way after it should in a damp squib of mixed emotions. Real shame. Number seven, Brock Lesnar versus Dean Ambrose. Uh. Oh, Doctor, what a kick in the teeth, which is about five times more hardcore than anything that happened in this match. In uh. early 2016, Dean Ambrose was a really hot act, coming off a great IC title feud with Kevin Owens and Electric Royal Rumble Final mm -hmm. 2, and coming within a cat's whisker of winning the WWE title at Roadblock. WWE sought to capitalize on his momentum by putting him in a Mania match with Brock Lesnar, and not just any WrestleMania match. WWE made pains of stressing that this was a no-holds-barred I was looking forward fight. to this. People were excited. I w was legit excited. I knew Dean Ambrose was going to get his ass kicked but i thought oh we gonna see some it's gonna be some carnage dean ambrose is a guy you can pu keep punishing him and he will keep getting back up i knew he was gonna most likely lose but it would have been a fun car wreck did we get that no <laughs> WWE stoked that excitement by having a parade of hardcore legends slide into Dean's DMs and bequeath him their favorite weapons. Here's a chainsaw, said Terry Funk. Here's a barbed wire baseball bat, said Mick Foley. Did either of those weapons get used? No. Did they, Cox? What followed was a hugely disappointing 13-minute brawl where Brock, getting ready for another UFC fight, wanted none of Dean Ambrose's deathmatch daredevilry, reduced the affair to a standard Brock Lesnar German spammer, only this time with a few chairs thrown in. Criminal. Number six, yeah. <laughs> Seth Rollins versus Dean Ambrose. Hello again, Dean. Sorry about all this. Dean and Seth have had two, count them, two feuds have had at the very least moments of pure wrestling greatness, both of which ended in disaster because God is dead and Vince hung God's skull on his office wall. It really is hard to choose between them. Do we go with their original feud bursting out of the demise of the shield, Kool-Aid man style with big fight forever energy, a wonderful mm -hmm. SummerSlam lumberjack match, injury angle blowing mm -hmm. off inside hell and a sal, which was a pretty good match until it decided to end. End the feud, let's be clear, by Dean reading the answer machine message that Bray Wyatt yeah. left inside R2-D2. Or do we go with their second feud, months of build, teasing dissension, Roman leaving to battle leukemia, and Ambrose executing one of the best, most emotionally charged heel turns ever? That was a great heel turn. It happened right after Roman was leaving due to leukemia, and oh my god, that was good. And then they botched it. They turned this guy into Bane. I was so confused. I was like, you, it, it, it wrote itself. People were legit shot. This was so good. And they, they screwed it. Only for their blow-off match at TLC to be utter garbage with both men thoroughly checked out. Dean and Seth feel like one of those pairings that should have been destined to do this forever. But every time they do, it ends badly. Number five, yeah. Paul Heyman versus CM Punk. Okay, this is a bit of a cheat because really CM Punk versus Paul Heyman comprised three micro feuds that were all stitched together like a grotesque science experiment desperately pleading for death. Paul <laughs> Heyman turned on noted Paul Heyman guy, CM Punk, and then, before Punk could exact revenge, 
Mage made old CM run the gauntlet of his dangerous alliance uh -huh. of increasingly shit men. CM Punk versus Brock Lesnar was an excellent feud, Fine. excellent match at SummerSlam, but then Brock peaced out and less good Curtis Axel took over. The feud was still all right. It was Punk promo battling Paul Heyman after all, but the match at Night of Champions was not very good. Yeah. Then Ryback got involved and oh god, this swan dog rat is bleeding from its eyes. What was once the feud of the summer ended with a reet bad Hell in a Cell match between uh -huh. Punk and Ryback and by that point, everyone was just glad it was over. Number uh -huh. four, Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg won. Sometimes Ooh. a wrestling feud doesn't have to have a lot of narrative steps to be good. Sometimes it's as simple as asking the audience, do you like this guy? Uh -huh. Yeah. Do you, Do you like, like this, this guy? guy. <laughs> yeah. Good. Because they're going to kill each other. Great. Wrestling's 80% hype at all times. Sometimes half of booking a feud is just deciding to host a dream. At the time, man, this was one of the biggest, like, the biggest matches. That biggest match that WWE could put on at that time. They were just mega stars, and people wanted to see them collide. Until they found out they were both leaving, and people said, screw this. Screw both you guys. Team match not doing anything to diminish either wrestler until they fight. F***ing simple. The first Lesnar-Goldberg feud was this, down to a veiny T. Both men were hypermobile cows who earned PhDs in pummeling huge dudes. So by all rights, them fighting at WrestleMania 20 should have been a meat taculous fireworks show of big boys doing big boy things, and everyone was very excited right up until a few days before the show when news leaked that Lesnar was joining Goldberg and leaving the company, and the hardcore New York fans let their abandonment issues hang out with their wang out, pelting the match with hatred, uh -huh. and in turn, both competitors turned in a horrendous non-match of five minutes stalling, one move, five minutes stalling, to constant booze. How did it go so wrong? Oh, wait, I, I told you how it went wrong. Yeah. Number three, Bret Hart versus Vince McMahon. Still to this day, Vince's last singles feud, and when you think about it, this being a goodbye to Vince McMahon would have been wonderfully poetic if the match hadn't also been one of the worst yeah. in the history of WrestleMania. Before the Montreal screw job, Vince McMahon was an on-screen personality, sure, but more like a host. He'd sit on commentary, welcome people to shows, run the occasional interview, but that was it. Then the Montreal screw job happened, the fans turned on Vince for orchestrating that play, and suddenly Mr. McMahon was born, an egomaniacal dictator who'd grow increasingly more villainous and hands-on with his own product and mm -hmm. there's an easy vince hands-on joke in there and i'm not gonna make it point is <laughs> vince being retired as a character by the very man who helped create him that's a great story and should have been great much all the work was done by wwe with a simple passage of time a match 13 years in the making and then it mainly they it up with a series of unconvincing <laughs> weird story beats, a series of unconvincing weird heart family members, and a glacial pace that turned 15 minutes into what felt like an hour. An yeah. awful end to what could have been something Should've truly been way historic. Better of Number a match. two, Triple H versus Randy Orton. If I could describe WWE in three words, it would be Chunky Punch Bunch. If I could describe WWE in another three words, it would be Can't Stop Meddling. So many times <laughs> WWE have had all the ingredients for a simple, wonderful feud and a rendered it inert via either stretching it out, throwing uh -huh. in needless complications, or wackadoo finishes. Boy, did they meddle with this one. It was as simple a story as it could be. Randy is crazy. Mm -hmm. Randy commits serial McManicide. Uh -huh. That's Triple H's family. Uh -huh. Triple H is mad. They fight. Super great, super silly, super personal. All the main food groups of wrestling. And then the big match at WrestleMania 25. <gasps> So Did not live up to hype. Instead of leaning into the hyper-violent intensity of the feud by booking a no-holds-barred match, WWE booked a match that was so straight-laced that if Triple H even thought about breaking a rule, he'd lose his title. In theory, I get it. Orton mm -hmm. was being a clever clogs, playing mind games and goading trips into beating himself. Sure, I get it. In practice, Wank. No one wanted to see a restrained, rules-focused blow-off no, to this feud. Because this feud was so personal. My man's <laughs> DDT'd his wife and then kissed her while he was handcuffed. He kicked his father-in-law in the head. He kicked his brother-in-law in the head. He was disrespectful. Granted, this is kind of Triple H is doing because Randy Orton went back to the to the evolution days and um, pretty much Triple H turned on him. So this was his way of getting them back. This was personal. This was no longer about the championship. It was about destruction and that's what they went with.
feud. They didn't want the ref to keep telling Triple H, Oh, you want to stop doing that now? You want to be careful because I might take your title off you. They wanted violence. Yeah. When they didn't get it, they sat on their hands, leading to an awkward, quiet main event of WrestleMania. And number one, Hollywood Hogan versus Sting. A lot of this list has been <laughs> ragging on WWE, and to be fair, I've shown my working. But hot dog, no one ruins the potential of an all-time great feud like WCW. This match right here, Hogan versus Sting, the main event of Starcade 1997, mm. the pinnacle of WWE's insane white-hot run of business, and a feud that had been built for quite literally a year, was awful. In 1996, <laughs> the NWO showed up and ruined WCW, eating it from the inside like a parasite. Most of the company fell in line and joined the black and white, but not Sting. Instead, he left, watched The Crow a bunch of times, and then started hanging out in the ceiling, a vengeful uh -huh. spirit watching over the ring he once called home. For months, this happened until finally Sting returned to crush the NWO's head honcho, Hollywood Hulk Hogan. And after all this time, anticipation was at a fever pitch, with WCW doing their best buy rate in company history. That's how hot this feud was. And they f***ed it up so hard. So hard. It was so easy as well. Sting batters Hogan, NWO numbers game, turns tied, Sting fires up, overcomes the odds, taps out Hogan. Job done. It's job done. Yeah. Instead, they chose to do a false fit. Finish, Hogan hit Sting with the leg drop after battering the icon all match. Nick Patrick was supposed to do a fast count, but then he either forgot or was told not to by Hogan, depending on who you believe. Then Bret Hart restarted the match, which the fans had just watched Sting get trounced in and legitimately lose. Then Sting locks in the death lock and just wins. It's abysmal. Yeah, what was... manner of ego and idiocy leads you to the torpedo, the hottest feud in your company history? Quite possibly the most disappointing wrestling match of all time and that's our <laughs> list do you want to see more then check out this yeah that peak that was so convoluted bro that was that's just yeah that's that's the thing that's the thing in wrestling you get to that big match that everyone's been waiting for and then they either don't pull the trigger or they pull the trigger but by the time they pull the trigger you it, it, it's all convoluted now. Now you're like, wh what's going on? <laughs> Who's actually pulling the trigger now? So, but comment down below. Let me know what are some uh, feuds that you feel like were fantastic. And when we got to the, the final match, it just didn't live up to the hype if it wasn't on this list already. But I appreciate all the love and support you guys showing on the channel. Road to 150K, and I am still the undisputed YouTube wrestling champion of the world. Appreciate y'all giving me. See you on the next one. Peace.